Many people don't realize that learning one East or Southeast Asian language can open doors to understanding several others, even though they might not be directly related. In this video, we dive into the intriguing world of Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, Lao, Indonesian, and Malay languages, revealing how these diverse languages, each with its own unique history, share remarkable similarities in structure and usage. Join us as we explore the concept of typological similarities, those common features that simplify the learning process for languages that might initially appear vastly different. We will uncover aspects like the absence of verb conjugations, the crucial role of context and communication, and the unique use of aspect markers. These shared characteristics not only make learning these languages more manageable, but also provide a fascinating window into their cultural richness and historical ties. Are you ready to discover the unexpected connections between these languages? Before we delve into the six main typological similarities of Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, Lao, Indonesian, Malay languages, some of you might be wondering about my qualifications to discuss these languages. Let me briefly share my relevant background with you. My name is Tim Keeley, a professor of cross-cultural management in Japan for 42 years and the author of the book, a Life in 30 Languages. My journey with these languages began in the early 1980s when I studied Chinese literature in graduate school in Japan. When I say Chinese, I refer to standard Chinese or putonghua, as I find the term Mandarin a bit outdated because it originally means huanhua, the language among the officials of the Qing dynasty and guanhua is not used in China today to refer to the national standard language. My academic career includes teaching at Chulalongkorn University in Thailand over a period of 12 years, three months a year. I also conducted research interviews and wrote a book in Thai about Japanese subsidiaries based in Thailand. The similarity between Thai and Lao made it easier for me to learn Lao during my frequent visits to Laos over the past two decades. As for Vietnamese, my experience includes studying and using both the northern and southern dialects, complemented by over 13,000 kilometers of travel by motorcycle across the country on three occasions. Additionally, my engagement with Indonesian and Malay spans over three decades, enriched by numerous trips to the region, especially to Indonesia. With this history of studying and working with these languages, I'm excited to share insights that I hope will be invaluable if you're considering learning one, two, or even all of these languages. But before we start, here's a bonus. Our exploration extends beyond the six languages. Khmer, or Cambodian, and Burmese also share many of these linguistic features, further illustrating the rich tapestry of language in this vast geographical region. So let's begin our journey into this fascinating world of these languages and their typological connections. There is no tense indicated in the verb. Instead, they utilize contextual clues and aspect markers. Let me explain what context markers are. There are elements in a sentence that give us clues about the timing of the action based on surrounding information. For example, they can use time phrases like yesterday or tomorrow to indicate when an action occurs. For example, I go, or more naturally in English, am going, to the store. I went to the store yesterday. Chinese, 我去商店, 我昨天去商店. Vietnamese, 
ดยดีเดนเกิดขังหอมกว่าโดยดีเดนเกิดขังถ่ายชั้นใบรังคาชั้นใบรังคาเมื่อวานนี้เราคอยใบขันเมื่อวานคอยใบขันอินโดนีเซียสายเพริกุตโกกมารินสายเพริกุตโกมาเลยสายเพริกุกได้สมาลมสายเพริกุกได้ In these examples, you can easily see the similarities between Thai and Lao, as well as between Indonesian and Malay. I'm actually doing a study to see if Malay people see Malaysian and Indonesian as two different languages or just one language, which I will cover in a future video. So subscribe to not miss out. Now let's look at aspect markers. Aspect markers, on the other hand, focus on the nature of an action rather than when it occurs. They tell us whether an action is completed, ongoing, habitual, or occurring just once. This is different than tense, which is primarily about timing. Aspect markers provide a unique perspective on actions, emphasizing how they unfold over time, rather than just. Pinpointing them on a timeline. For example, in Indonesian and Malay, sudak signifies an action is completed. Belum indicates it is not yet completed. In pernak, is used to express having had the experience of doing something. For example, he went to Japan. Dia sudak pergi ke Jepang. He hasn't gone to Japan yet. The Belum Pergi to Japan. He has been to Japan. The Perna Pergi to Japan. These sentences in Standard Malay are essentially equivalent. So let's examine how similar concepts are expressed in the other Asian languages. He went to Japan. He hasn't gone to Japan yet. He has been to Japan. In Chinese, Le Hai Mei Guo are used. Ta Chu Le Ru Ben. Ta Hai Mei Chu Ru Ben. Ta Zeng Qing Chu Guo Ru Ben. In Vietnamese, we have Da Chu Da Teng Ang A Da Di Nhat Ban. Ang A Chu Di Nhat Ban. Ang A Da Teng Di Nhat Ban. In Thai, we have Leo, Yang Mai, and Koi. Kao Bai Ipun Leo. Kao Yang Mai Bai Ipun. Kao Koi Bai Ipun. Similarly, in Lao, we have Leo, Yang Bo, and Koi. Very similar. Lao Bai Nipun Leo. เราย่างบ่บายญี่ปุ่นเราเคยบายญี่ปุ่น Now the next big thing we will examine is how these different Asian languages express future actions, desires, and intentions with respect to the idea of going to Japan. Note that they're not always exact equivalents in the various languages. Desires. I want to go to Japan. In Chinese, we can use "shang," which can mean "think" in general. "Shang yao" is more like "I want to," "I would like," and "yao" could be "want" or "need to," or "will" in the future. Well, "shang chu ru ben." So these all have slightly different meanings. "Yao" plus a verb can express to want or to need quite emphatically, a definite intention and a future action. In Vietnamese, we have "muốn," "đôi muốn đi Nhật Bản." In Thai, we have "yak," "chan yak bay Nhật Bản." In Lao, we also have "yak," "ko yak bay Nhật Bản." In Indonesian, we have "ingin" and "mau." Say "ingin pergi ke Jepun." In Malay, also "ingin mau hendak," shortened to "nak." Say "mau pergi ke Jepun." Then we have "necessity." I have to or Need to go to Japan. In this case, we could use "yao" in Chinese. "Wo yao chu ru ban." In Vietnamese, we have "gan phai." "Doi gan phai di Nhật Bản." In Thai, we have "dong." "Chon dong bai Nhật Bản." In Lao, also very similar. "Dong koi dong bai Nhật Bản." In Indonesian Malay, we have "harus." "Saya harus pergi ke Jepun." Jepun. What about intentions? For example, I intend to go to Japan. In Chinese, we have "da suan." "Wo da suan chu ru ben." In Vietnamese, we have "zi ding ko i ding." 
Now for future actions, I will go to Japan. In Chinese, we can use a number of different ones. Here we'll use in Vietnamese, we use se, doi se di nyepan. In Thai, we use ja, chan ja bai ipun. In Lao, we also use ja, koi ja bai nipun. In Indonesian Malay, akan, saya akan pergi ke Japan or Japun in Malaysian. Now, for ongoing actions, like I'm going to Japan right now, in Chinese, a number of different ways, like sai, zheng, zheng sai, zhi, wa, Note that in Chinese, that zhe is more nuanced and less common in this context. In Vietnamese, dang, doi dang di nyepan ye baize. In Thai, as I mentioned before, we have gam lang. Chan gam lang bai yipun do ni. In Lao, we also have gam lang. Koi gam lang bai nyipun do ni. In Indonesian and Malay, we have sedang. Sai sedang pergi ke Japan sekarang. And the next similarity among this group of six languages in this video is the lack of plural forms for inanimate nouns. And hang in there because it also reveals a lot about the different mindsets between the West and the East reflected in these languages. In Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, and Lao, nouns generally remain the same whether they are singular or plural. The context, including numerical indicators or other qualifying words often determines the plurality. For example, in Mandarin, shu, book, doesn't change form, whether it's singular or plural. Instead, context and quantifiers like iben, shu, or hento, shu, many books, make the distinction clear. Indonesian and Malay occasionally use reduplication, doubling of the nouns, to indicate plurality. For instance, buku can become buku-buku, books. However, this isn't always mandatory, and it often depends on the context. Reduplication can also convey other nuances like variety or intensity, not just plurality. For example, anak-anak can mean children, plural, or can convey a sense of various kinds of children. In many Asian cultures and languages, including Japanese and Korean, there is a greater focus on the substance of things rather than viewing them as discrete objects. This perspective emphasizes the continuous, collective, or general nature of entities. In contrast, Western languages and cultures might be more inclined to categorize and differentiate objects as distinct entities, leading to clear linguistic distinction between singular and plural forms. In many Asian languages, the need to distinguish between singular and plural may not be as pronounced. Next, we have the non-use of to be with predicate adjectives. In these and many other Asian languages, the use of the copula or linking verb such as to be varies depending on whether the sentence has a predicate adjective or a predicate nominative. For example, in the sentence, you are beautiful, the word beautiful is a predicate adjective. These languages do not use the equivalent to be in the sentence. While in the case of you are a beautiful woman, the word woman is a predicate nominative and the equivalent of to be is used. Okay, let's take a look at some examples. You are beautiful versus you are a beautiful woman. Ni hen mei, ni shir iga mei li den yu ren, where shir is equivalent of are, you are. In Vietnamese, ban dep, ban le mok ngoi phu nu sin dep, la here is equivalent to you are. In Thai, kun sui, kun ben pu in sui, where Ben is equivalent to you are. In Lao, 
Chao Ngam. Chao Ben Puing Ngam, where Ben is again equivalent to R. In Indonesian, Kamo Chantik. Kamo Adala Wanita Yang Chantik. And Adala equal to you are. In Malay, Awak Chantik. Awak Iela Wanita Yang Chantik. In Indonesian and Malay, the Adalak or Ielak, the equivalent to R, are often omitted, unlike in the other languages. Finally, the lack of definite articles in these Asian languages, the, is a notable grammatical characteristic that shapes how ideas and objects are expressed and understood. It highlights the importance of context in language and reflects the diverse ways in which human languages categorize and communicate about the world. As we come to the end of our exploration of these six fascinating typological similarities among East and Southeast Asian languages, it is clear that understanding these shared linguistic features can significantly enhance our ability to learn and master these languages. Even though languages like Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, Lao, Indonesian, and Malay might not be directly related, the commonalities they share provide us with invaluable shortcuts for picking up these languages. In addition, we can understand more about how culture is reflected in language. If you find this approach useful, please check out my video for learning the languages of the East Asian cultural sphere, which includes China, Vietnam, Japan, and Korea. And remember, the more you learn, the easier it will get, and the stronger your mind becomes. See you in the next video.